Hello, my name is Jonathan Finder. I am a pediatric pulmonologist at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. I'm going to talk to you today about uh, how to prevent respiratory complications in muscular dystrophy. We like to, to meet boys with muscular dystrophy sometime in the first uh, six years of life, mostly so you get to know your resources and you know who can help you um, when it comes to lung problems. Um, but once the kids uh, turn six, we want to see them about once a year just to get lung function testing. Uh, and certainly it's important that um, once boys reach a, a, a level of um, muscle disease that they need, they're in full-time in a wheelchair, we want to see them at least once a year. Um, as, the, um, as the years go by, we want, we want to see the boys more frequently, about every six months once you hit to the mid to late teens, so we can really screen carefully for for um, breathing problems. And the major way we, we do our screening is by measuring lung function. So what is a lung function test? Well, the, the word you'll hear a lot is spirometry, also called pulmonary function test. And a spirometry, the word spiro means breathe and metry means measurement. So it's literally, literally measuring your breath. And so some of the me measurements include how much air can you push out of your lungs. That's FVC stands for forced bottle capacity, and that's how much air can be ex exhaled completely using all your effort to, to exhale from your lungs. And how much comes out in the first second is referred to as FEV1, which is the forced expiratory volume at one second. But mostly we rely on the FVC in terms of making decisions. We can also measure pressures, which is how much pressure can you generate by pushing out uh, with your belly muscles um, by, by bearing down. That's called uh, a maximum uh, expiratory pressure. Men's maximum inspiratory pressure, how much pressure can you generate with your diaphragm as you inhale? There's also called, something called sniff nasal inspiratory pressure, with, which is called SNP for short. And that's a very easy measurement to make. You just basically put a little pressure sensor at the nose and, and just have a person make a sniffing sound. And that's, uh, that's, coming of, uh, that's becoming more commonly uh, done. And then finally, uh, we like to, um, in later stages of disease, uh, measure how much carbon dioxide is in your exhaled breath. It's a way of measuring for whether you're developing respiratory failure when you're awake. There are four stages of respiratory involvement in this disease. And, and the ages I list in this slide are, are very um, rough. But roughly speaking, in the first decade or so of life, there's no significant respiratory involvement, um, not much at least. And we'll talk about some occasional um, problems. But in, in this stage, we want to see the kids about once a year. We want to um, make sure the boys receive flu vaccination because the flu can be a real problem for anyone, especially if you have muscular dystrophy. And we want, to, and by educate, I mean that I, I want you to know who I am. I want you to meet my colleagues in pulmonology so you know who your resources are. Um, the second stage occurs always after the boys are full-time in wheelchairs, and it's usually in the first uh, um, uh, sorry, in the second decade of life, sometime between age 10 and 15, that the development of, of inadequate cough can, can show up. The third stage is when you don't have enough breathing uh, strength when you're sleeping. You breathe fine awake, but then when you're, fine, when you're deeply asleep, um, your breathing is not going to be sufficient. And the last stage is when your breathing is not sufficient when you're awake. And this is the, the, the last age tends to occur in the late teens to early 20s. And uh, again, these ages, these, these, um, these ages can vary significantly by, by different therapies and by, um, by different genes. Um, we're going to skip over the stage one where, where your reading is fine because um, there's no significant things besides vaccination and an annual visit. But the stage of inadequate coughing is sneaky because you can have no sense that you don't have an adequate cough until you get a, a cold, a respiratory tract infection. And then you have difficulty with clearing your secretions. And this is where you risk developing pneumonia. The great thing is that we can tell you who needs help with coughing well before you get a cold by measuring PFTs, lung function testing, pulmonary function testing. We can also measure peak cough flow or peak expiratory flow rate. And this is a measurement of how, much, how quickly can you push air out of your lungs. And so there's not a lot of data, but we, we generally say that if your flow is 
is um, under 160 liters per minute, and you'll, the, sometimes the pulmonary function test will report at liters per second, so it's just a matter of multiplying that number by 60 to get the liter per minute. And we can get approval for assisted coughing under a, under a, a peak expiratory or peak cough flow rate of 270 liters a minute. Now, these numbers aren't that important to you, but the doctor should be aware of that. And I put the references on the slide as to where these numbers come from. Um, so in general, I, I'm aggressive about getting people assisted with coughing, because I would say better to have it too soon than too late. And um, so there are different ways of assisting cough. Um, early on, people would do what's called manually assisted coughing. And this is something that is done um, around the world, because the, the device needed for manually assisted coughing is inexpensive. It's called an Ambu bag, and that's a bag that basically you can inflate the lungs with a with basically a silicone or rubber bag. And um, GP breath stands for glossopharyngeal breath. That means that you use your mouth and lips to push air into your lungs. It's kind of like gulping air into your lungs. Um, that's not a very effective way of coughing, uh, helping a person cough. It requires a caregiver to give either a, a push on the belly, an abdominal thrust, or else squeezing the lower end of the ridge, rib cage to help force the air out of the lungs. Um, it's a little bit uncomfortable to do because it, because it pushes on your stomach. And if you have a scoliosis, which means a contracture or a curve in the back, it can also um, that can limit the effectiveness of this technique. I have a picture of it, and you can see uh, here a, a respiratory therapist is. It, it looks like a Heimlich maneuver where she's really pushing up on this man's um, belly and, and therefore forcing the lungs up, and that helps the cough, but it's not that effective as compared to uh, mechanically assisted coughing. And so this is something that we've really pushed in the past two, two decades or so. And mechanically assisted coughing is actually really effective. And even if you have a tracheostomy, it's effective too. And you can use it by almost any interface, mask, mouthpiece, or even if you have a trach. And it's a really effective therapy. And we strongly support using this, even if you don't have a cold or a cough at all. Because if you deeply inflate the lungs, um, it will help pop the lungs open and prevent what's called atelectasis. That word means areas of volume loss or collapse within the lung. And because you can get little plugs of mucus that you don't sense, and that can cause loss of volume in the lung. And the other thing that's wonderful about using a device to help with coughing is that by the deep inspiration, the deep, the word is insufflation, which means basically inflating your lungs, it also helps you stretch open your chest. Uh, your chest wall, and therefore it stretches the, the the chest wall muscles. We think about stretching as a really important part of muscular dystrophy, but in fact, there's no direct way of stretching the muscles between your ribs aside from deep breathing. And so we like to do this to keep the lungs nice and the lung, the chest wall uh, uh, compliant. And so I'm a big fan of using this device for a form of physical therapy of, of the chest wall. And so we'll talk about what, the, what devices are out there. Um, the major one is in the, um, the right lower corner of your screen, and that's the, the new, new version of the uh, cough assist device by Respironics. But there are other ones out there, and I have, I have a picture of the previous model in the upper left corner called the cough assist. Uh, it's sort of the, the, the version that was made by Respironics and uh, Emerson. And then um, in the upper, um, upper right corner is the, the Nippy Clearway, which you'll find in... Um, in the UK and Australia and other parts of Europe, and there are other devices out there as well. And then finally, in the left lower corner of the uh, screen, uh, there's the Hillrom device called the Vital Cough. And they're all essentially the same. They all push air into your lungs and then suck it back out again. They're very effective and take a little getting used to, but they're really kind of amazing um, devices. And um, I'm a very strong proponent of getting these to my patients. Um, uh, they're not inexpensive. Uh, the the cost here in the United States is probably around four to five thousand dollars. It's always covered by by health insurance, um, and I have had families um, obtain a spare one just just to uh, out of pocket because they wanted to have one for travel. The nice thing about the new version of the of the Respironics um, uh, cough assist in the lower right corner is that it'll run off a car battery and it has the internal battery, so it's it's um it's very portable, and it's also much more lightweight than the older models. 
it's important for families to be aware that if your child gets hospitalized and a low oxygen level is detected by typically a little red probe that they put, like a band-aid they put on your finger, it's called a pulse oximeter, um, the natural instinct of doctors and nurses and, and other people who take care of patients is that when they see a low oxygen level, they give you oxygen. It makes sense. The problem is if your um, oxygen level is low because you're in respiratory failure, then the, the extra oxygen can actually suppress your breathing, can, you suppress your drive to, to breathe. And so if you get put on oxygen in a hospital um, and no one's monitoring your CO2 levels, you can go into respiratory failure. So this is a, I, I warn everyone, oxygen isn't always your best friend. And so we should be very, very careful if ever you're given oxygen in the hospital um, to make sure that the carbon dioxide is being monitored. And, and I want you to, to take that home and remember that because that could save a life. Um, other complications we see um, in the first decade or decade and a half can be obstructive sleep apnea. So what is that? Obstructive sleep apnea is, means that you're trying to breathe in, but your airway collapses and you cannot actually breathe in. So you, the effort to breathe is there, but the flow, the airflow into the lungs stops. And it's very common in the general population, but especially common in boys with muscular dystrophy. And because they have anatomy changes, so boys tend to get a large tongue in this disease. And they also, be, because of, of use of steroids, tend to be obese. And also because decreased muscle tone in the upper airway can lead to collapse in sleep. And there's a stage of sleep called REM, which stands for rapid eye movement. And you're very deeply asleep, but also in the REM sleep, your muscles are fully relaxed. And that um, means that that your any any areas of decreased tone are made worse. And so you need a sleep study to diagnose this and to treat it. And so it's easily treated. Uh, and it's, it's treated with something called uh, CPAP, which stands for Constant Positive Airway Pressure. And it's given by a mask. And um, and the level of how much CPAP your boy needs is, is, is adjusted in a sleep lab. It, it's not just prescribed without laboratory assessment, because you want, you want to make sure that, that the mask fits carefully and that there's not too much or too little pressure being delivered. And whenever um, a, a sort of guy who, let's say he's 10 or 12 years old, needs CPAP, I always make sure that, that the device that they're given doesn't just deliver CPAP, because eventually you're going to need more support than just a single level of pressure. You're going to eventually need BiPAP support. So I always make sure that, that um, uh, a device that is delivered to the family can can have the sophistication to give different kinds of ventilation. There are the CPAP machines are less expensive than BiPAP machines, but um, it, it, it's a, it's a matter of, of making buying one device rather than two different devices. Um, we'll talk more about BiPAP. Um, and in stage three, we see um, that the breathing when you're deeply asleep uh, is not sufficient and it, it turns out, interestingly, that if you measure on the lung function how much air you can expel from your lungs, and that's called the FVC, I can virtually guarantee you who needs uh, help with breathing and sleep. If your FVC is less than 30% predicted, then you're pretty much guaranteed to need help with breathing and sleep. So we start measuring. We don't obviously wait until they're below 30% to get um, sleep studies. We actually will start getting them under age. Um, uh, under 50% predicted. Um, but also, when I talk to someone, I, I ask about what's the quality of sleep. And for me, the biggest red flag is, is a morning headache. If you wake up with a, with a morning headache, that's a huge red flag. Because what happens is the, the high CO2 levels in your body for, has um, a, the effect on your brain of causing you to have a, to have a headache. It has to do with blood flow into the brain. And so a morning headache is a major red flag. But there are subtle changes like rather than having a normal two or three or four awakenings in, in, at night, um, there could be five or ten um, or more awakenings. In other words, the kids can't stay asleep, so they wake up and they ask mom or dad to turn them. And parents think it has to do with, with muscles or, or muscle disease. It's really more about the, that when they, go, when they fall asleep, they're going to risk or failure. And the, the result of poor quality of sleep leads to daytime sleepiness 
and change in school performance, and even sometimes they can get kind of cranky because they're, they're sleep deprived. Um, in the home, you can do an overnight oximetry study and see saturations dropping below 90, but that's um, not the gold standard. The gold standard is really a sleep study in which, in which we look at CO2, which is carbon dioxide retention, um, especially uh, in, in the stage of sleep called REM sleep, which is the rapid eye movement or dream sleep. So the major way we approach treating uh, respiratory failure in sleep is, is called BiPAP. Now BiPAP actually is a brand name, and I'll mention that later. But it's, it is a way of supporting breathing with a non-invasive interface. In other words, a mask or nasal prongs or something that is on the outside of your body, not, not going into your neck with a, with a hole like a tracheostomy. Um, BiPAP stands for bi-level positive airway pressure. And it's essentially, uh, uh, it helps you breathe in with an inspiratory pressure, but also the expiratory pressure helps keep the airway open. So um, it turns out that BiPAP is a brand name uh, from Respironics. And there's another device called VPAP, which is the, the version that's made by another very good company called ResMed. ResMed, and those are the two major companies that make these devices. And they're small, they're lightweight, and they, and they just sit on the bedside, and they're attached to a, um, a tube and then a mask that, that, that is... Um, sort of strapped on the face of the patient. And once you get used to it, they're, they're quite comfortable, but you have to have a good mask that, that fits your face well. This is a paper um, that I like to cite that shows that the majority of boys whose FVC was less than 30% in musculoskeletal needed to be um, on support, on BiPAP support. And um, it's just a way of saying that um, even without a sleep study, I, can t I generally know who needs support but once kids get below 50, I want to get that sleep study done. Um, the nice thing about sort of taking care of kids in the 21st century is we no longer have to be so aggressive like with tracheostomies. Though I haven't ordered a tracheostomy in many years. Um, we want to avoid oxygen. As I mentioned before, oxygen will actually suppress your body's drive to breathe. Um, we like to use uh, uh, BiPAP. It's important that if you have respiratory failure, do not use CPAP, because CPAP is a single level of pressure, and it does not support breathing. It just supports keeping your airway open. And so CPAP will increase your work of breathing without actually helping with ventilation, which is you know, essentially your breathing. But the, the secret of success here is mask fit. I will tell you that this is the hardest part of my job, is getting a good mask to be comfortable, because if the mask is uncomfortable, Kids will tear it off and sleep. Who wants to be sleeping with something that's uncomfortable? And of course, you get pressure sores. So mask fit is really important. And there are many, many different interfaces made. There are many different masks, and it's important to find one that fits your son's face. It's also important to get a sleep study to make sure that the, the right amount of pressure is given, not too much and not too little. We tend to use a high span. In other words, a r more, more BiPAP than you might need if you were uh, uh, had a normal strength if you had BiPAP for obstructive sleep apnea, which is sometimes done. So uh, the next stage we see in in um, muscular dystrophy is once you get once you're on. So again, you've gone through the stage of needing help with coughing, you've gone through the stage of needing help with breathing and sleep, and then and then uh, a few years later you'll find that 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 the, the breathing awake is not enough. And um, that used to be back in the old days. Um, we used to uh, recommend a tracheostomy, but not anymore. Most, most of my patients are managed non-invasively, which means we use a, a lightweight ventilator attached to the back of a wheelchair, and it, it, the interface essentially is a mouthpiece. And this really facilitates getting out of the house, going to school or work, and the goal, the goal of life is to get out and do stuff, not to stay home. And so there are a lot of devices out there that are out there, and I'll show you some pictures. And here's a picture of a young man, um, and you can see he, and this is a guy in complete respiratory failure, and he has, you can see him breathing with a mouthpiece. You can see his dog is on his bed. <laughs> and uh, you can see that he's online. And um, so I have more pictures of them. There are many different devices out there. I have, I mentioned two devices, the Trilogy, um, and the, the um, Polynex LTV 1150. There are other devices out there as well. Um, and you can see this is Kevin, the same page. This is a few years pr uh, prior to the previous picture. And you can see that essentially 
this this is a ventilator that's that's attached with a tube um, on two uh, mouthpiece right in front of him, so he he can just reach out and grab it with his lips and, 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 and inhale off of it. And you can see the important thing as we look at at this device is that little gooseneck arm, and it has to be right readily available to the patient, so he can inhale when he wants to. And you can see there's an inspiratory and expiratory limb on this on this um, on this ventilator setup, and it's set up by the respiratory therapists and also the wheelchair, wheelchair fo folks help you mount it to the chair. And um, there's another, I have another picture of um, this is now a um, this is a young man. His name is Matt, and he has a different um, device. He has the uh, Trilogy ventilator matched, and re Respirox makes their own arm. And you can see this little sort of black the black beaded um, device is a way of holding the um, the rubber, the soft rubber um, um, tubing in place right by his mouth where he needs it. And um, here's another guy, and uh, he's actually um, using his mouthpiece ventilator as he graduated from law school. Um, and so it's a pretty great thing that this guy, in, in complete rest of failure, became an attorney and uh, and uh, did, was very successful in his career. Um, Never having to have a tracheostomy, never never being hospitalized ever, just with good support. Um, and then one more picture of Patrick there. Um, so we're going to shift gears and talk a little bit about things to worry about, which are the pulmonary emergencies. Are there are not many of them, but you need to know how to manage them. But pneumonia is obviously um, why we um, try to get people cough assist device before they get into trouble. But it's sometimes um, they can sneak up on you, and of course you can get community-acquired pneumonia. It's just normal people get pneumonia. But and it's hard to differentiate pneumonia from areas of collapse within the lung. The word atelectasis is a doctor word that means volume loss within the lung that causes some collapse of some of the lung tissue. And it can be difficult to differentiate volume loss with collapse. Like for example, if you have a mucus plug, in the air and the lung sort of collapses behind that plug from pneumonia because they can look very similar on a chest x-ray. And so um, obviously pneumonia is you, know, you're, you have secretions, you're coughing, you need a lot of airway clearance therapy in a, with a coughing device and uh, you might have a low oxygen level from that. But it's important to differentiate whether the oxygen level is low because of the pneumonia or because of respiratory failure and you have to man, man, you have to look for CO2 retention, and so that's why I, we, in this previous slide I talked about how oxygen can be harmful if if not carefully managed. Respiratory failure can 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 show up seemingly out of the blue, where a person it seems to be fine, and then they get a bad cold, and then they wind up in distress. And so again, you have to be thinking about that. You have to make sure that that someone is measuring CO2. The most common way we look at, at, at the blood level of carbon dioxide is, is just with a finger prick blood gas. It's called a capillary gas. It's almost painless. It's a very tiny little finger prick, and you can measure someone's CO2 but without having to, to do with the old-fashioned way, which is to get an arterial blood gas. That's, that's a, a bit more of an invasive stick where they have to stick a, uh, a needle into the artery. We don't like to get those anymore. But the least, the least painful way, and the, frankly the simplest way, is just to measure the CO2 in your exhaled breath. I love getting that because it is completely painless. And uh, if you have the right device, you can quickly know whether someone has a normal or a low or, or, or a high uh, carbon dioxide level, and you can give them some ventilatory support as needed. Um, something that happens not commonly, but uh, commonly enough that we want everyone to know about is called fat embolization syndrome. This occurs usually in the 24 hours or so window after a broken bone. And what happens is fat from the bone marrow can travel into the lung, and it can cause uh, a blockage of, of blood flow into the lung, and it leads to respiratory distress. It's managed basically um, with support. There's no specific therapy for it. It, it. It'll get better, but it's important that it not be mistaken for something else like a pneumonia. And um, there are ways of, of diagnosing this, and we have some uh, material on the PPMD webpage about about fat embolization syndrome. But if you have, if your boy has trouble breathing after a broken bone, that it should be your number one concern, and you should bring it up to the doctors treating treating your son. So that's all we have for today, and I really want to thank you for spending the time to to listen and and, and watch my talk.